Hebrews 5, verse 1. David already read that passage to us, and we're going to look at it with a little more depth now. God's great priesthood. And we're going to do a little survey of God's priesthood, and hopefully this will uh, be enlightening to us, especially as we focus on Christ. Non-Christians often question biblical faith. You've probably experienced some of those questions. You know, I want to, sometimes I think they're really interested, and other times I think they just want to trap you. You know, Jesus had that same sort of experience as he dealt with some of the religious leaders of his day. I get questions all the time about our Christian faith, especially when you bring up the things about Jesus Christ and about the Bible. But one of the questions I get over and over again is this, is that why are there so many religions? You claim there's one way to God, but why are there so many religions? Well, my answer is this. There's only two religions. There are only two religions in the world. One is that you have to work hard at something you have to do. You have to work hard at something you have to do. The other religion is trust what has already been done for you. That's it. Now, they all come in different flavors. True Christianity is the fact that something has already been done for us, and we just trust what has been done for us through Jesus Christ. All other religions is there's something you have to do to make yourself right with God. That's it. And they come in different flavors, and you'll hear different names concerning religions, but there's only two. And that often catches an individual by surprise. And then you go further with what is expected of the true religion in Jesus Christ, trusting him and him alone. And you ask if they would like to accept that, if they'd like to receive that forgiveness. And oftentimes their response is, not right now. Because there's an unwillingness to give up control. You see, that's why there's so many religions today, because religion says that you're in control, that you can do something to win God's favor. Christianity reminds us that all you can do is surrender to what God has already done for you in Christ Jesus. Turning from sin and self and trusting him alone. That's it. It's pretty simple, isn't it? Not easy, but simple. Who likes to deny themselves? Who likes to quit sinning and following the Lord? It doesn't appeal to our flesh. Certainly when the Spirit lives within you, it's a desire that you have, that is to live for the Lord in a surrendered state. Now, questioning biblical faith, especially biblical faith in Christ, is not only for the non-Christian. You know, those who come to Christ by faith also are susceptible to, to doing the same. And there's times when you and I as Christians, we question our faith. Now come on. Everyone in this room has had those moments where you've questioned the reality of your faith in Christ Jesus. Oftentimes when persecution and suffering for the gospel's sake comes your way. And then you wonder, is it really worth it? I remember as a new Christian, excited about this faith in Christ, the change that God brought to my life. And then we were ready to have another child. Heather was pregnant, excited about our new life with a, a new baby. And then she lost that baby. And then I started questioning my Christian faith. Why, God? Why would you do something like this to somebody who has just come to you trusting you? I began to question my faith. Then there are those who wonder if they'll ever get to the place of God's power, experiencing the promised rest that we've been looking at. Will I ever get to that place where I have that rest and that peace? I know for the last several months I've just been dealing with emotional things. I'm not an emotional person, but something's going on in my life where I've, I've struggled with, with frustration and discouragement. and I, I, just, I, I know that I'm resting in the Lord, but it's still is a part of my reality. And I'm hoping for all of that to go away one day. But I am trusting the Lord, but nevertheless, I'm still dealing with this turmoil. We'll get there. I wonder when, but I know I'll get there. 
And then there's those theological issues. You come to Christ and you hear this thing about Trinity. God is one, but he's three. And you scratch your head and you're thinking, how does that work? That God is one, yet he's three in one. And then you have to question again the issue of suffering. How about failure in your life? Whether it be relationships, whether it be financial, career-wise. Why am I failing? And then, Jesus Christ is really the only way. What about all those good people that are in other religions? You think, they should be okay too. Shouldn't they get in? Then you wonder, is Jesus really the only way? And what about children? You and I know that it is a responsibility for each person to respond to the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, to verbalize it, to yield their lives to it. And then children, unfortunately, at times, they leave this world. They die. And then you scratch your head, what happened to them children? And you wonder, if a person needs a profession of faith in Christ Jesus, and these children have ever done that, what happens to them? And then what about all those people throughout the world who's never heard the gospel? Because they've never had the opportunity, are they going to hell? I mean, you've had to deal with these questions. The answers aren't easy, but they're there. And as you grow, God reveals more and more to us about who he is and what he has done and how he continues to deal with mankind. But we've had those questions, suffering. We've had theological questions. And we have these wonderings about our faith. Well, these, this audience that Paul is writing to, they were also struggling with some questions. They certainly had the idea of suffering and persecution as part of their circumstances. They were being persecuted by their own family, their own Jewish faith. They were being persecuted by the religious, not only religion, but also the political world. And they were wondering, you know, is this really worth it? Is it really worth it? And then they had their theological questions. Here is God Almighty whom they worship. God Almighty to whom they turn to. God Almighty who made promises of sending his Messiah. And God became a man? They came to Jesus Christ by faith as it appears. And then they began to question, can God really become a man? Think about that. For me, that's the greatest miracle of all. Christmas celebration is probably the greatest miracle for me. The fact that the creator, the sustainer, the all-powerful, the almighty God became a human being like you and me. That blows me away. I still struggle with that today. I don't have to understand it all, but I certainly trust it by faith because that's what God's word told me. Now, they struggled with the same thing. And so he wanted to answer those questions. And one way he answered the question is in the fact that uh, this Jesus is superior to angels, which we have seen previously. He's superior to Moses. He's superior to Joshua, giving the rest that Joshua couldn't. And now he moves to the place of Aaron, the priesthood. He said, he's superior to Aaron too, who is the father of the priesthood the high priest. And he says this, as he goes through this passage, he does a comparison and a contrast. What Aaron brought and what Jesus brings. And that's what we're going to look at this morning, that I hope will instill confidence in us as you and I, no matter what we go through, we have a high priest that we can turn to in every situation, every struggle, every question, every wandering. We can turn to him. And trust him to take care of us. You ready? All right. Your outline this morning. Let's look at the priesthood of the Old Testament. Number one, the qualifications. The qualifications of an Old Testament priest, as we see here in this passage. Now there were others, but here's the ones Paul brought out, brought out for us. The qualifications of the temporal Old Covenant high priest. What were his qualifications? Letter A. He was understanding and merciful. Look at verse 1. He was taken from men. No, who's going to understand you better? Someone who becomes like you? Of course. Because they then are able to understand, 
sympathize with what you go through. They, they, like basically, Jesus walked in our shoes, so to speak. See, he was taken from men. He could have been taken from angels, right? There are religions that teach that. But he was taken from men. He was like one of us so he could understand us. For the listeners, that's probably not a, not a problem. They, they understood that the priest had to come from human beings rather than any other source. But they still scratched their head. God could become a man. Let her be. He had a divine calling, again, in verse 1. My Bible says he was appointed to service to God. Now look it down in verse 4. This service and responsibility of being a high priest, he went on to say, no one takes this honor on himself. Instead, a person is called by God. That's why it's so important to me when you and I deal with our church life that if an individual feels, senses that they need to be in a ministry, that they're doing that because God is leading and directing them to do that. Oftentimes our response is, if nobody else will do it, then I guess I'll do it. Or, more so in a Baptist church, let somebody else do it. Let somebody else do it. But not this church, right? We want to turn to God and say, God, what, do you, what would you have me to do? as a part of this body of Christ. What is it you want me to do? And once God does that in our lives, there's no one going to be able to shake that. No one will shake that if you're convinced God is leading you in a ministry, in a service. In chapter 8, concerning the high priest, verse 3, for every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. He's, a, again, a reminder of being appointed. In Exodus chapter 28, verse 1, when God began the high priest, the priestly uh, responsibility and service, he turned to Aaron. Aaron being the first of the high priest with his sons. So God had already shared with Aaron and all of his descendants that they would become his instrument on behalf of others. He, they would become the high priest priest family so to speak and from them high priests and priests would continue to come and then in numbers chapter 16 there were those who weren't happy with that so they tried to democratize it we see Korah Dathan Abiram they decided that what we'll do instead of seeking God for direction concerning a high priest and follow his plan we're going to take a vote and decide who's going to be a high priest. And guess what happened to them? The earth opened up and swallowed them. Not a good plan. Trust God. God will lead us. I remember in early in my ministry when, when we had a, a deacon, an opportunity for men to serve as deacons, we began to pass out ballots. And I always wondered, is God really honored with this that we're passing out ballots? to vote and decide who should be a deacon. I think any ministry, God can give that leadership, and we can trust God to put that on a person's heart, and we can tell. I, I think you can tell most of the time that God is moving in a person's life, and we can trust him to do that. And you can trust him. And that's why, over and over again, Paul said this, repeating Old Testament passages. Today, if you hear his voice, don't Harden your heart, but respond to him. If he's leading you today, respond. Today is the day. Let her see. Although he was called by God, he was for the benefit of man. See verse, verse 1 again. He was service to God for the people. See, in the Old Testament, God was unapproachable. Remember in the Garden of Eden, not too long ago, when we looked at the book of Genesis, it seemed like a long time ago. Actually, it was a long time ago. But remember when Adam and Eve sinned, God cast them out of his presence, and they were no longer able to approach God. Now, it doesn't mean that God didn't approach them. There were times where God approached man. Obviously, it happened to Abraham. And then in Moses' day, God approached Moses. He invited him into his presence. And then he told the rest of the people, don't even come near the mountain. I'm 
unapproachable, basically. And then the tabernacle and the temple. There was a veil that separated God from the people. And God invited only the high priest to come into his very presence. Why? Because they ministered on behalf of the people. The people had a need, and these priests were chosen by God to bring the needs and to bring the presence of the people into the presence of God. That was their job. Letter D. He had a humbling ministry. Look at verses 2 and 3. He had a humbling ministry. You know what a humbling ministry is. If you work in the nursery, that's a humbling ministry. Amen? It's challenging sometimes. You know what it is to be humbled. Verse 2 and 3. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he is also subject to weakness. Because of this, he must make sin offerings for himself as well as for the people. Now, he's able to deal gently. Now, remember back in chapter 4, verse 14, it says that he's able to sympathize. Jesus sympathizes with us. The high priest sympathizes also. That basically means to suffer with someone. But here, to deal gently or to have compassion, it means to suffer with someone to a limit. It basically means this. As a high priest, he had an emphasis to, uh, to balance that between moral weakness and then his as being a human as well as his responsibility to help he knew his weakness he understood the weakness of the people but yet he still had a calling from god to help these people you know oftentimes that's our response how can me a sinner help someone who who needs to get right with the lord well that's what god uses he uses people like you and me to impact the lives of others and so this high priest had the responsibility of understanding what the people went through because of his own sinfulness, but then he had the high calling to bring their sacrifices before the Lord so that they might know of God's forgiveness. They had privileges. They offered gifts, and then they had, no doubt, that's a privilege. See, gifts were for thanksgiving. Gifts were for you know, appreciation to God reverence to God, honoring God, and then there were the blood sacrifices for the forgiveness of sin. And who did he help with these blood sacrifices? Those who sinned. And who were the ones that sinned? Number one, he could only help the uninformed sinner. See verse two? It says those who are ignorant. Now, that word is used differently today. When we talk about those who are ignorant, we usually talk about people who aren't very bright. They're just ignorant. But that's not the case concerning this word here in the passage. It means those who just weren't informed. They didn't know. How many of us here as Christians, as we grew in our relationship with the Lord, became aware of a sin that we were committing because God showed it to us through his word? Been there? Done that. That's ignorance. I didn't know. And so the high priest, it tells us in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 7, the high priest alone enters the second room, and he does this only once a year, and never without blood, which is offered for himself and for the sins of the people who commit, who commit these sins in ignorance. Leviticus chapter 5, verses 17 through 19, reminds us again that someone who dies without knowing it, or someone who sins without knowing it, violates the law's commands concerning anything prohibited. He bears the consequences of his gift, but then he has to offer a sacrifice is because he becomes aware of it. So that's what happens to in the Old Testament. They just didn't know, and when it was revealed to them, then they knew they had to sacrifice, and they went before the priest to take care of that. Number two, they also he can only help the unintentional sinner. Again, in verse two, it says those who have, are going astray. Now, it had to do more with passion. He just had a passion for the wrong things. And you'll notice that in Leviticus chapter six, Verses 1 through 7, the Lord spoke to Moses concerning people who had a passion for things rather than trusting the Lord. And as a result, they sinned. And then they had to also sacrifice a blood sacrifice in order to be restored in their relationship with God. It was restitution. There was a man in the New Testament who experienced such a thing. His name was Zacchaeus. 
In my opinion, Zacchaeus understood that he sinned in passion. He understood that he wronged people. And what was his response when the Lord came to his house to eat? Girls, remember what Zacchaeus, what happened to Zacchaeus when, when he sat down with Jesus and Zacchaeus told Jesus what? If I've done anything wrong to somebody, what am I going to do? I, I'm going to make it right, aren't I? I I'm going to restore what I've done wrong. I understand now what I did was wrong. And then what's interesting is there was no blood sacrifice after that. It was almost to me like Jesus said, let's sit down and eat. And soon I am heading to atone for your sin. I'll take care of the rest. Because of his passion, he sinned. Because of ignorance, they sinned. Now number three, he could not help the defiant sinner. Now here's where I struggle. Here's where I struggle, and I think you would too. There was no help the Old Testament priest could provide for a defiant sinner. In Numbers chapter 15, verses 30 to 31, but the person who acts defiantly, whether native or foreign resident, blasphemes the Lord, that person is to be cut off from his people. In other words, if they premeditated, if they thought it through, if they went ahead and did it, there was no hope. Aren't you glad you live in the New Testament? The high priest could not help the defiant sinner. That person is to be cut off from his people. He will certainly be cut off because he has despised the Lord's word and broke his commands. His guilt remains on him. Wow. This happened to Saul. Samuel came to him in chapter 15 of 1 Samuel, verses 22 to 23. King Saul obviously sinned, defying the Lord. And he said to the king, he says, does the Lord take pleasure in birth offering and sacrifices? Here he was acting like a priest when he should not have been. Does the Lord desire obedience more than sacrifice? Yes. He says, look, to obey is better than sacrifice. To pay attention is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and defiance is like the wickedness and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of Lord, he has rejected you as king. Man, talk about no hope. Aren't you glad we live in the new covenant rather than the old covenant? Psalm, 119, Psalm 19, verse 13. Moreover, keep your servants from willful sins. Do not let them rule over me then I will be innocent and cleansed from blatant rebellion. They cried out to God for forgiveness. You and I can do the same thing. We understand what blatant sin is. We understand what rebellion is. We understand when God tells us no and we go ahead and do it anyways. When God tells us to do something and we fail to do it, we know what that is. And we have a high priest who sympathizes with us. And let's turn to the high priest now that sympathizes with us. This Jesus. Number two, the qualifications for the eternal, the eternal new covenant high priest. The Old Testament high priest was temporary. The New Testament high priest in Jesus Christ, he is eternal. Letter A, his high calling from God. Now he was the Messiah, the promised one. Hebrews, again, chapter 5, verses 4 through 6. No one takes this honor on himself, instead a person is called by God, just as Aaron was. In the same way, he's, now he's talking about the Messiah, God's promised one, the Son of God. The Messiah did not exalt himself to become high priest, but the one who said to him, you are my son, today I have become your father. Also said in another passage, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now that's a struggle for you and me. When you hear the Bible tell us that today you become my son, you and I understand that Jesus is God. He's the second person of the Trinity. He always existed. Was he not son before he became flesh and blood? No, he was not son. He was the second person of Trinity. As the second person of Trinity, God himself, he submitted himself to God himself. And he became a man. 
Now, I know that's kind of tough to swallow, isn't it? That the second person of the Trinity left his godhood behind and became like you and me. And when he became flesh and blood, the Holy Spirit went into a woman. And that woman bore a child. And that child became the Son of God. The second person of the Trinity subjected himself to God Almighty, and God became his Father. Now you're probably scratching your head thinking, how does that work? Don't worry, I scratch my head all the time with it. But it's okay. We can trust God in what he has done. Today you become my son. Number one, that was a promise of the Old Testament because in verses 5 and 6, the promise was made there in Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, Psalm 110, verse 4, and those were the actual verses used here in our passage this morning. Basically, that he was taking their Bible and explaining to them who this new high priest is, this Jesus whom they've come to know as their Lord and Savior, at least profess faith in the fact that he was Lord and Savior. Number two, he was a position of humility. No, it said he did not take honor, nor he didn't take this honor upon himself, nor did he exalt himself. And Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 through 9 remind us of that. Instead, he emptied himself, Philippians says, by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of man. And when he had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on the cross. For this reason, for this reason, because he humbled himself, because he was obedient to the Father's leadership and direction in his life, because he was subjected to himself, because he was subjected to the Father, God highly exalted him and gave him the name above every name. Did you ever wonder what that name is above every name? It's not Jesus, even though we honor and revere his name. The name given to him that is a name above every name is that he is Lord. And the position given to him that is above every position, that he is our high priest. And we submit and subject ourselves to him. In John chapter 8, verse 54, it reminds us of his humility in his ministry. I glorify, if I glorify myself, Jesus answered, my glory is nothing. My father, you say about him, he is our God. He is is the one who glorifies me. Do you see the surrender? You see what Jesus did? He surrendered to God. You see what God's called us to do? Surrender to him. Number three, his priesthood is perpetual. It's a perpetual priesthood. He's uh, in the order of Melchizedek. Now, in Gen Genesis chapter 14, verse 18, we meet Melchizedek, and we understand him as being a king. We don't know where he comes from. We don't know his family lineage. I personally think that was a theophany. The second person of the Trinity appeared to Abraham. Abraham met Melchizedek, and it was there that he offered his tithes because of his greatness, because of his provision, because of all that he had done. I think he recognized the greatness of Melchizedek, and I, and I believe at that point that Melchizedek was the second person of the Trinity revealed to Abraham, which reminds us in this passage that Jesus is from the order of Melchizedek, a priesthood that had no beginning and no end. It always existed because it's a priesthood from God himself. And we know it's unending, as we see in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 3, but it did, the Old Testament priesthood did end. There at A.D. 70, when the temple was destroyed, there is no more high priest priesthood in the Jewish faith. And the Old Testament practice of high priest ceased to exist. Next is chapter 40, verse 15. It says that this priesthood was to be a everlasting throughout their generation. That generation ended in A.D. 70 when the temple was destroyed. And now, in Christ Jesus, we have no longer a temporal priesthood, but an eternal priesthood. And this is the compare and contrast he's making. What you had before was temporal. What you keep wanting to turn back to was not expected to last forever. But what Jesus has offered us in his response, his ministry, his priesthood, it is forever. Why do you want to go back to what's temporal when you can have what's eternal? Why do you want to go back to what is 
suffers in sin to something that has been victorious over sin. Why do you want to keep turning back? Go forward in Christ Jesus. Letter B, he identified with man. I, I, I so much appreciate this about Jesus, that my God, my Savior, became like me. During his, verse 7, during his earthly life, he offered prayers and appeals with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. See, Jesus suffered greatly on the cross physically. But what he suffered spiritually for our sin is beyond what you and I can comprehend. The second person of the Trinity, always in relationship with the Father, the Holy Spirit, always in that relationship with the other two, for all eternity, experienced our sin and was separated from his glory, his honor, his position. He suffered spiritual death for you and me. And he prayed because he knew the power of sin in his own life. He anguished over what that would be like for him. And he cried out to the one and the only one that could save him from death. He was heard because of his reverence. He was heard because of his honor. He was er heard because of his fear of the Father. Therefore, he was God's son. He learned obedience through what he suffered. Number one, he clearly felt the pain of sin. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, it tells us that the word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. Philippians chapter 2, verse 7, he became like a man. He knows what it's like to go through what we go through today. I hope you, I hope you hang on to that. Sometimes we act like God doesn't understand. God doesn't know what I'm going through. God knows exactly what you're going through. He knows what it's like to be rejected, ridiculed, mocked, misunderstood, suffer loss of family, hunger, thirst, neglect, betrayal, and physical abuse. He knows it all. And then we cry out, God, this pain, this loss, it hurts so much, it's breaking my heart. But God is carrying us in his arms. And he says, I know, I know. That's my high priest. That's our high priest who knows what we're going through. He is the one and the only. There is no other priesthood but him and him alone. It's to him that I can turn to over and over again to know that he knows what I'm going through. Number two, he feared the penalty of sin. I got that in Luke chapter 22, verses 90 through 46, when Jesus was in the garden. That's what he was struggling with. That's what he sweat drops of blood over. The fact that he would suffer spiritual death on our behalf. And he just surrendered to the Father and said, Father, not my will be done, but yours. I can trust nobody and nothing but you. And he submitted himself to the Father by becoming sin on our behalf. And he became spiritually dead. But did the Father leave him there? The Father resurrected him. And he is our hope. Number three, he faced the persecution of suffering obediently. He became obedient in going through what we go through. His obedience was a result of his human experience. Philippians chapter 2, verse 8 tells us he experienced it to the point of death. I just want you to remember again that suffering is not always a consequence of personal sin. You hear me? Suffering is not always a consequence of personal sin but it's rather adversity to, uh, to edify. Sometimes we go through difficult times so that God may build us up and strengthen us in our faith. Jesus didn't go through suffering because of personal sin, but he went through it so he would know what it was to be edified. Who honored, who glorified Jesus, who exalted him? The Father. Just as the Father will exalt and honor Jesus you and me. And oftentimes he does it through difficulties and persecution. And let us see, he provided eternal salvation for man, for man through the once, listen, the once and for all sacrifice. Look at verse 11 of chapter 10. 
every priest stand day after day ministering, offering the same sacrifice time and time which can never take away sins. They just kept offering it over and over again, but it could never take away sins. It was only Jesus who could take away the sins. But this man, after offering one sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down at the right hand of God. What do you think that you and I could accomplish? What can we sacrifice? What can we give God to make ourselves right with God? Absolutely nothing. Nothing! He sacrificed himself once and for all as the great high priest so that through his sacrifice you and I might know forgiveness through ignorance we might know sin because of passions and we might know forgiveness of sin as a result of our own defiance of the word of God that's the great high priest we have the high priest was limited in the Old Testament, but this new high testament priest in Jesus Christ has no limits. And no matter what we've done, no matter how horrific, God stands ready to forgive us, for he has made the sacrifice that provides our forgiveness and our cleansing. After that one sacrifice for sin, in verse 12 of chapter 10, it says that sins forever he sat down at the right hand of God. How many sins? All the sins. For how long? Forever. Guess what that means? The salvation that we have in Christ Jesus cleanses us from all our sins. Nothing's there. And it is forever. That's the great high priest we have. Never to be repeated. Once and for all. Now, number three, I want to conclude with our own priesthood. The qualifications for the priesthood of the believers. That's you and me. Those of us who trust God's forgiveness through Jesus Christ. First Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says that we're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, so that we may proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light once we were not a people but now you are god's people you had not received mercy but now you receive mercy all because of the great high priest jesus christ who sacrificed himself for you and me letter a it's available to anyone who will come it's available to anyone who will come it's an invitation he says i'm willing to forgive you matter of fact i've already forgiven you you just haven't received it yet do you know how you know that you've come to Christ for forgiveness of sin? You've come through humility. Knowing that it was nothing you could do. All you can do is surrender to him. All by faith. Verse 9 says, after he was perfected, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Who are the ones who obey him? All the people who do the right things, the morally right? No, that's not the ones who obey him. The ones who obey him are the ones who come humbly before him. In James chapter 4, verse 6, he says that he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. The ones who just say, Lord, I can do nothing. Lord, I am nothing. And all I do is surrender myself to you. Those are the ones for whom God gives his grace. They're the ones who are obeying him because you can't come to Christ unless you obey him in humility. Verse 7, or chapter 7, verse 25. Therefore, he is always able to save those who come to God through him, since he always lives to intercede for them. Letter B, it's available who, to anyone who comes by obedient faith. Verse 9, the latter part tells us it's eternal salvation through obedient faith. There we go again. Is this about being simply obedient to the things of God? No, that'll never get you right with God. Doing the right things will never make you right. Only surrendering to Jesus Christ will make you right. In verse 5 of chapter 1 of the book of Romans, or chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What is it you have to do? You have to surrender. That's it. There's not enough prayers, there's not enough church you can go to, there's not enough money you can give, there's nothing you can do 
but humbly surrender yourself before the Lord Jesus. And this is what Jesus said. This is the work of God. In John chapter 6, verse 29, that you do what? This is the work of God. What's the work of God? That you believe in the one he has sent. That's it. All God is doing today is he's working in people's lives so they will come to the place to believe in him. Have you tried other things? Have you tried religion? Have you tried your own way? Have you tried to be a good person? Have you tried to do the right things? Have you tried everything? Keep trying. You'll always miserably fail or fail miserably. But when you come to surrender and trust him and humble yourself, he gives grace and mercy to them. Let me tell you, those who do not believe do not humble and do not obey. No matter how morally good they appear, they are not gods and they are not saved. Only those who humble themselves before him. I have First and Second Thessalonians just a reminder of humbling ourselves in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let her see. It's available to anyone who will confess him as Lord. Look at verse 10. He says he was a part of the order of Melchizedek, not Aaron. What's Melchizedek? Again, it was the eternal order. He's the only one. Basically it's this, folks. There's no man that you and I can go to in order to come into the presence of God. You and I have only been given and joyfully given the Lord Jesus Christ. So we can go to him and he's the one that enables us to come into the presence of God. Because of Jesus, you and I have access to God and we rely on absolutely no one else to provide that. Him and him alone. Folks, that's got to be good news to you and me. You don't have to come to me for prayer, even though I love to pray for you. You don't need to come to me for forgiveness. You don't need to come to me for God's teachings. God has made it all possible for you and me through Jesus Christ that we can come to His presence, in His presence, no matter where we are. Always, for all eternity. That's got to be good news. It's the greatest news ever. I go through no one but Christ and Christ alone. And those who will confess Him Confess him. Just as God confessed his son, you and I confess Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. We can come to God. And Jesus has made it possible. There's only one way, through Christ and Christ alone. He's made it simple, but it's not easy because you have to turn from yourself and trust him. Whatever you're struggling with today, let me remind you again, you have a high priest who's fully aware of it and understands. But he's a high priest that just doesn't sympathize with you. He's also taking care of what you're going through. And you can turn to him. And he will bring you into the presence of God Almighty. What a sweet deal. Father,